Anyway, let's get to uh, real life lore's a video on Yemen. I want to see. Focused on the brutal war being waged in Gaza that's already claimed the lives of tens of thousands of people. I'm telling you, I think like real life lore and a lot of other like OSINT adjacent people, unless they're directly, unless they're just like primed to try and get like a fucking free internship at some State Department adjacent third party contractor, they're most likely going to be like, yeah, this shit doesn't look good. Something else is happening nearby to the south in the Red Sea that has the potential to escalate the war between Israel and Hamas into a greater Middle East-wide conflict that's already severely affecting the entire global economy. You see, after Israel initiated its full-scale invasion of Gaza, the Houthis, a Shia Muslim military organization in Yemen that's funded and armed by Iran, declared their full unwavering support for Hamas and the Palestinian cause against Israel. But geographically located about 1,600 kilometers away from Israeli territory and more than 18 hundred kilometers away from the main fight going on for the record this was my biggest l which nobody really gives a shit about it was like thinking uh thinking that i love that you said also kind of an outdated video already bro it's literally january 17th it's from yesterday um all i'm gonna say is i i thought the yemeni people didn't have the smoke i was wrong on that okay I was wrong. I was wrong on that. They do have it. The smoke is something that they do have. These YouTube, yeah, I was a doubter. I was a doubter. These YouTube channels are bankrolled by U.S. agencies. I think uh, some of the history channels, some geopol ones. Arlo's been paralleling imperialist propaganda recently too. I mean, I don't know if it's because they're being directly bankrolled or because they genuinely have this ideologic ideological positioning. It's much simpler to just say that, like, yeah, no, these guys, I think for the most part, uh, have this framework that they operate off of. Why? Because if you're the likes of real life lore, and if you fancy foreign policy, then where are you going to go? You're going to go to think tanks. Okay. You're going to go to the FDD, right? The, what is it? The foundation of like defending democracy or whatever the fuck, right? Because those are the guys who are genuinely constantly reporting on whatever the fuck's going on. Now, if you read their shit, Inevitably, you are going to adopt their framing. Ain't nobody's out here in the American military industrial complex in the think tank sphere the, it, it doing uh, uh, genuine on the ground reporting without uh, a, a real slant that is pro America. Right? Do you understand? So I think that, like, a lot of people. I mean, there's exceptions, but uh, a, a lot of people that get their information from like that think tank sphere because they want to have the most up to date shit, right? They are going to inevitably adopt the framing of these institutions, these institutions that are directly populated by people that were a part of the military industrial complex. They are a part of the military industrial complex or directly are a... a a outsourced version of like America's uh, imperialist interests. So I don't think that it's as like uh, suspicious or as, you know, uh, as much as a conspiracy uh, in the way that like a lot of people uh, perceive these channels to be like, oh, you know, Vosh is a CIA asset or whatever. Like, no, man, what the fuck? No, people just want to be smart and people want to come across knowledgeable on these issues. And if you want to come across smart and knowledgeable on these issues, the only places where you can get up-to-date information that is like as reliable as you possibly can be is going to be a lot of these think tanks that are created specifically so that they can uh, create material evidence that ends up, of course, always, almost always justifying America's involvement in the country. And, uh, and, and you naturally lean towards uh, uh, American imperialism, right? That's it. Also, if he was a if if Vaj was a Fed, he would have never said that you know he wanted to uh, nuke uh, Israel. <laughs> so that's not you lose your State Department paycheck very quick if you say some shit like that. Anyway, so let's continue. In Gaza, the Houthis were incapable of he participating in the war happening. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, he said glass Israel, and and you're right. 
around Gaza directly. And so they decided to begin intervening on the side of Hamas more indirectly. In November of 2023, the Houthis declared that they would begin attacking every single ship they could find sailing nearby to their territory in the Red Sea that was linked in any way to Israel, including any ships traveling to or from Israeli ports. Didn't he say he was literally an informant? An informant for what, dude? Like, horse cock? What the fuck do you think he's informing the federal government on? What are you talking about? It's probably a joke that people took seriously. People, God, people take fucking YouTubers so goddamn seriously and everybody does it. Everybody does it. Like, everybody that thinks they're above it thinks that that is, like, real. Okay? Your humor is too dry. Yeah. I think like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I do legitimately think that like a lot of people place so much emphasis on YouTubers thinking that like we move the fucking needle in any meaningful direction. And it's so silly. And I think it's a byproduct of like how powerless we ultimately are in the face of like American empire, for example. Like, no matter how much we fancy ourselves to be a democracy, you look at the hundreds of thousands of people that are fucking protesting in D.C. this past weekend um, for Palestinians, okay, um, and, and uh, trying to stop Israel's endless bombing campaign, and there's not even a fucking fraction of that in the media as far as coverage goes, and nobody cares, and time goes on, and we continue. We continue doing exactly what we were doing. Uh, all right, let's continue. Any ship with Israeli ownership, any ship flying an Israeli flag, or any ship with an Israeli crew. And then they further stated that these attacks on Israeli shipping would continue indefinitely until Israel fully withdrew from Gaza and ended its war against Hamas. But there was a slight problem with the Houthis' plan. You see, the ownership structure of the globalized 21st century merchant shipping fleet is a very complicated business. Merchant ships very often travel between origin and destination in different countries. The ownership structure of the ship itself is often divided between multiple different nationalities that may have nothing to do with where the ship's origin or destination is. The flag of call that the ship flies may be completely different altogether, while the crew that's operating the ship may be of completely different nationalities from everything else as well. Determining which merchant ships operating on the world's oceans are considered Israeli or not is not as simple a task as as it appears at first. But that didn't dissuade the Houthis from deciding to intervene anyway by attacking whatever ships they determined were Israeli. Their attacks began on the 19th of November 2023, with a brazen hijacking of an empty car carrier sailing through the Red Sea. So this part is not entirely correct, I think. As far as I understand it, they didn't just like flagrantly attack uh, uh, whoever they decide is like uh, pro-Israel. I think they... I think they were, um, they determined they were Israeli. Of course, you're not going to fucking, fu like, that's not how international commerce works. He literally openly admitted that earlier. But I think, like, I think that um, they look at the routes off of, like, readily available data. Um, but beyond that, they also radio in, from what I understand. I might be wrong on this. But I think they radio in and ask, like, and I mean, it's, it's a blockade. It is exactly how America would do it. Okay. The difference is it's not America doing it. That's the point. And it wouldn't actually be exactly like America doing it. America might even blow your shit up. So I think that one, a lot of this information is readily available online. That's one, like about what shipping routes uh, certain commercial vessels are taking, yada, 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 where it's going, what the, maybe not what the manifest holds, but still. And the other thing is like, they, they call it in, they radio in, and basically they, hold on. Where the fuck? Oh, there it is. Okay. So yeah, they radio it in and they, they say, hello, this is Ansar Allah Navy. Marhaba, please stop and tell us where you are uh, flying in from. Okay, and then the ship says something like, at the top of the hour, there's a three minute ad break. Have you thought about that? 
And then the guys are like, it's over. It's over. We're coming in. That is the real terror. We must stop it. And then they take over the ship. However, all you needed to do was just subscribe for $5 or for free. Thank you. Very racist. Respect. No. Thank you to the anonymous gifter with the 10 gift of subs. That was traveling from Turkey to India. The Houthis raided the ship with a helicopter that transported a heavily armed special forces squad onto the ship's deck, who quickly managed to subdue the ship's crew and rerouted it back to the Houthi-controlled port of Hodeidah in western Yemen. The ship was called the Galaxy Leader, and its registered owner was a company known as Galaxy Maritime Limited that's based in the Isle of Man, a UK dependency. The ship was being chartered by a Japanese company, its flag of call was based in the Bahamas, and its 25 crew members hailed from the Philippines, Romania, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and Mexico. The only connection that the ship had to Israel was that the company that owned the ship, Galaxy Maritime Limited, was further owned by another company known as Ray Car Carriers, which is a business that's co-owned by a well-known Israeli businessman and billionaire named Abraham Ungar, who has a current net worth of approximately 3.25 billion US dollars. Wait, what? Based on that, the Houthis decided that the ship was fair game to attack and hijack, and it would be far from- Oh my god, I didn't even know that. Wait, so it's not fucking ra Wait, what? Wait, that's crazy. I I'm out here literally thinking that they're just like taking over commercial vessels that don't respond to their calls. Turns out this motherfucker is owned by this motherfucker is owned by an Israeli dude. What the hell? How the fuck did you not know that? No, I didn't know Galaxy Leader was owned by an Israeli dude, owned by an Israeli company. Wait, the Houthis aren't orcs? Wow, who would have thought? No, that doesn't matter. I'm simply stating that normally... No, yeah, I'm being for real. There is a way to enforce blockades, shatters. That's what happens when you do your own research. Yeah. There's a way to enforce blockades. And... Uh, I suspected that it was, I mean, I listened to what everyone was saying, including what the Houthis were saying, which was that they were tracing um, these, uh, uh, they were tracing these shipping companies, they were tracking shipping companies, and intercepting vessels that did not respond. That's how you, you know, that's how you would enforce a blockade on the Red Sea, on the condition that What? What is this? What? No, stop, dude. You are brain broken, brother. Why would you ever do that? We're not doing that. I don't care at all. Oh my God. I, guys, you just, you just misunderstood what I was saying entirely. I do not think that Bosch is a literal federal informant or agent. What the fuck would he possibly be able to do federal informant uh, duties on? What are you talking about? From the last. In the weeks and months that have followed after that initial attack, the Houthis have unleashed a torrent of hundreds of missiles and drones and launched further hijacking attempts against dozens of merchant ships Fed, caught sailing through not. the Red Sea. Merchant ships that have been linked to dozens of countries from all around the world. And the missiles, drones, experience, and intelligence that they've received to launch all of these attacks have largely all come from a single source. Their biggest patron, the Islamic Republic of Iran. 
Iran has spent years carefully cultivating the Houthis from a ragtag group of militia into a legitimately dangerous state-like military force. With a massive arsenal of guided anti-ship missiles and swarms of cheap explosive kamikaze drones that they can use to overwhelm maritime anti-air defenses with through sheer numbers. Backed by Iran, the Houthis have arguably become the most dangerous and heavily armed piracy force in modern history. And unlike the pirates before them that used to launch out from Somalia and raided commercial shipping in the Arabian Sea, the Houthi pirates control a significantly more advantageous geography to wreck the global economy from. They currently dominate the northwestern third of Yemen's territory, including most of Yemen's population and most of Yemen's coastline along the Red Sea, which gives them direct access to launching hijacking ships, missiles, and drones into one of the world's most critical arteries of globalized trade. The Red Sea itself can be thought of as the primary maritime passageway between Asia and Europe and the passageway is bounded by two narrow gates on either side of it that regulate access through it. The Bab al-Mandeb Strait in the south between Yemen and Djibouti, and the Suez Canal in the north that runs across Egypt. The route between these gates across the Red Sea is a part of the sh- It's so funny. When you think about Djibouti, like, I just go back to that one guy who made a- This is how every real life lore video is like about Djibouti. Anyway, whatever. Shortest possible continue. geographic route for merchant ships to take traveling between Asia and Europe. And so, it's the preferred route of choice for container ships carrying manufactured goods and raw materials from places like China, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and India to take when transporting their goods to the huge European consumer market. And from another perspective, this trade route is also a major artery for the flow of global energy resources from origin to consumer. Like oil and gas from places like Russia, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan towards Asia in one direction, and oil and gas around the Persian Gulf towards Europe in another direction. As a result, roughly 12% of the entire world's trade volume usually flows through the Red Sea on an annual basis, which includes nearly a third of the entire world's container ship traffic, roughly 10% of the world's seaborne oil, and roughly 8% of all the world's LNG. An average of 50 merchant vessels usually transit through the Suez Canal on a daily basis, and this overall makes the Suez Canal and the Bab al-Mandeb Strait the second most critical maritime choke point for globalized trade anywhere in the world, remaining only behind the Singapore Strait in Southeast Asia in over overall importance. And all of this massive volume of trade and energy that usually flows through the Red Sea makes its overall security and stability an extremely important core interest for dozens of countries and actors from all around the world. To Russia, the Red Sea is still its most- I loved, I loved when he's like, when the real life lore spoof video was like, and that's how Ukraine is gonna be the new North Korea. <laughs> Somehow, uh, Ukraine belongs to North Korea vital artery for exporting their own crude oil and LNG resources by sea towards their new primary consumers, China and India, while Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan rely on the route to a lesser extent for their own oil exports as well. From China's perspective, the Red Sea is its most vital artery to receive energy resources from Russia through, and to transport their own manufactured products to the European consumer market through, which is of similar concern to Japan, and largely why both China and Japan maintain overseas military bases in Djibouti nearby to help help safeguard their own trade routes. To Qatar, the Red Sea is its primary trade route to export their LNG supplies to Europe. While to Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Iraq, the Red Sea is their primary trade route to export their crude oil to Europe through. To the European Union, the Red Sea is their primary trade route for receiving manufactured goods from Asia and energy resources from the Persian Gulf through. While to the United States, Washington wants to ensure the continuous flow of maritime trade through the Red Sea to keep the global economy and globalized system that it champions and protects humming along. And Egypt, as the controller of the Suez Canal that regulates all of this trade, stands to arguably benefit the most when the trade is running smoothly, and lose out the most when the trade isn't running smoothly. Egypt's Suez Canal Authority is the- Damn, dog. Seems to me like all the more reason to maybe, I don't know, instead of continuing the genocide that recently uh, had ceased, you just kind of uh, treat these guys as like independent actors with their own genuine opinions and, and wants and needs and maybe listen to the demands that they're making and fucking pull back from pull back from um, your unconditional support to Israel.
the guardian of the canal, and they charge various fees and tolls on every ship that passes through it, as ships usually have no other alternative. The only other possible geographic choice the ships can take to travel between Asia and Europe is the much, much, much longer way all the way around the entire African continent, around the Cape of Good Hope, a route that usually adds anywhere between 7 and 10 days of travel time and significantly higher costs for ships to take. Under normal circumstances, the tolls and fees that Egypt charges on ships passing through the Suez Canal are still much cheaper than the alternative of sailing around the whole of Africa, and it's also usually one of the Egyptian government's largest sources of revenue. As the world began recovering from the logistical supply chain bottlenecks that were caused by the you know, other than U.S. aid. I love the notion that America is the protector of free trade, by the way. Like, definitely. America is so the protector of free trade that, like, they tell often our, our um, international partners that are under the influence, under the sphere of American imperialism to not cooperate with people outside of said sphere, whether they are foreign adversaries like Cuba or Iran or Russia or China. Even though we maintain a delicate trade relationship with China that is very important, we will tell the Netherlands, for example, not to give chip technology to China. America is not the protector of, uh, you know, free enterprise or fair trade or free trade in general. America is the protector of its own personal interests, obviously. COVID-19 pandemic, an all-time high record number of ships passed through the Suez Canal during the fiscal year between June of 2022 and June of 2023. 25,887 ships took the journey, which also netted Egypt an all-time high annual revenue from the Suez Canal, about 9.4 billion US dollars, about enough to help fund 10% of the entire Egyptian government's operation. Yeah, before people say, isn't that every country? Of course it's every country. The only problem is other countries aren't claiming something like, uh, other countries don't get to say, we are not self-interested. We're actually protecting this ideological concept of free trade. That's the difference. Why do people not understand that? My point is America lies and acts like, uh, it's a, a protector of like international commerce when it routinely violates it. Just like America often acts like it cares about international human rights law right? In the rule-based liberal order that we maintain, except we make the rules and we give the orders. That's the rule-based international order. Operating budget. And this is all in addition to the fact that many countries can only import their goods from abroad through the Red Sea. The only maritime ports that Jordan, Sudan, and Eritrea have are all just located on the Red Sea, while Djibouti's port nearby to the Red Sea on the Gulf of Aden currently supports roughly 95% of landlocked Ethiopia's trade volume. And so, the safe, secure, and reliable flow of trade continuing through the Red Sea is extremely, extremely important to all of these dozens of countries from all around the world, both near and far from it. But unfortunately, the Red Sea has always existed within one of the most geopolitically turbulent regions in the world, and ships are also at their most vulnerable when transiting through either side of the narrow gates on either end of it. Both the Suez Canal in the north and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait in the south can be blockaded intentionally or even accidentally, and when they are, the Red Sea passageway for global trade comes to a complete halt. This has happened twice before in fairly recent history. Once for a long period of eight years, when the entire Suez Canal in the north was shut down between 1967 and 1975, during the Arab-Israeli Wars, after Israel secured control over the entire Sinai Peninsula and, in the process, the Suez Canal itself became an active frontline war zone, dividing Egypt Egyptian and Israeli zones of control for those eight years until Israel agreed to return the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt. And another much shorter time when the canal became closed once again much more recently and much more memed about in 2021, when a container ship known as the Ever Given got blinded during a sandstorm when transiting through the Suez Canal and crashed, blocking the canal's entire width. For six days and seven hours, the ship blocked all passage through the Suez Canal like a cork stuck in a bottle, and dramatically slowed down trade between Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. 
Hundreds of trade ships carrying nearly $10 billion worth of goods became bottlenecked. Many ships decided to give up and rerouted the long way around Africa, and once it was freed, the Egyptian government initially demanded more than $1 billion in compensation from the Ever Given's owners. And then on the other side of the Red Sea, the Bab el Mandeb Strait is merely 23 kilometers wide at its narrowest point, and so it basically functions more like a two-lane highway for merchant ships, with one highway running south and the other running north. A single ship can't really get stuck and block the strait in the same kind of way that it can in the Suez Canal. But the Bab el Mandeb Strait is located in a far more precarious neighborhood. Right now in 2024, there are still ongoing violent civil wars raging all around the strait, in Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, and Ethiopia, that just over the last few years have likely resulted in the deaths of more than one million people. While Eritrea is ruled by a ruthless dictatorship that is often considered to be on the same scale of totalitarianism as North Korea, Djibouti alone exists as arguably an island of stability within this maelstrom of chaos. And that's why foreign countries from all around the world maintain significant military bases in the country to protect their own national interests, from China and Japan to the United States, France and Italy, and probably shortly Saudi Arabia as well. well the yeah, I thought it was Ukraine that was the real West Korea, turns out. Ukraine is not the real West Korea. Korea. Eritrea is the real West Korea, also known as North Korea. United Arab Emirates maintains another base nearby in the self-declared state of Somaliland. And Russia is attempting to acquire a former United Arab Emirates military base in Eritrea, here at Assab, directly adjacent to the strait. For years, the biggest threat that was facing shipping going through the Bab el-Mandeb Strait were the Somali pirates who raided merchant vessels mostly for money, hostages, and ransoms in the Gulf of Aden and in the Arabian Sea. A problem that lasted well into the 2010s until it finally began dying down after 2017, as maritime patrols from the American, UK, French, Russian, Chinese, and other international navies began conducting better patrols and better escort missions of merchant shipping through the region that dissuaded the pirates from launching any further attacks that could disrupt the global economy. But now, the Houthis in Yemen are the ones launching dozens of attacks on this critical global Big trade L. artery, and it's already been severely affecting the worldwide economy. The Houthi movement, which is officially known as Ansar Allah, which translates to Defenders of God, arose out of Yemen's Zaidi Shia Muslim community who make up about one-fourth of Yemen's overall population, and are native to the hills and mountains of Yemen's northwest immediately opposite of Saudi Arabia's own largely Shia Muslim community immediately across the border. Formed with militant opposition to the United States, Israel, and the Saudi monarchy's influence in the Middle East in mind, the Houthis sought closer relations with Iran, while their official motto and flag have never left any doubt as to where they stand politically and ideologically. It reads from line to line, translated into English, as God is the greatest, death to America, death to Israel, a curse upon the Jews, victory to Islam. A decade ago in 2014, during the midst of the Arab Spring revolts that were sweeping all across the Middle East, the Houthis managed to organize themselves with support and funding from Iran, and stormed out from their hills to capture the Yemeni capital from the Yemeni government, Sana'a. From there, the Houthis managed to expand their territorial control even further across northwestern Yemen, while the president of Yemen at the time fled the country towards Saudi Arabia. At his own request for a foreign intervention to restore his own authority and crush the Houthi rebellion, Saudi Arabia decided to militarily intervene in Yemen's civil war beginning in 2015. The Saudis, along with many other Arab states... They don't even have an ideological gripe with Judaism? Yeah, I mean, but, you know, it, come on. Come on now. I don't think they make a distinction. I don't think they make a distinction between um, Israel and Jews, which, of course, why would they also? Because, like, um, Israel very, very, very deliberately tries to muddy the waters and say, no, we're doing this for Judaism all the time. You know? Yeah, Israel does not want you to make a distinction between Jews uh, and Judaism and Israel. They, they love that. So they can go, look how uh, much they hate Jewish people. Without Israel, you would not be safe. Why don't you have many people talk to their Jewish friends? Hmm, I wonder why.
Well, they can't because uh, they were purged. Now, having said that, having said that, Fed posting going hard today. I mean, none of that, none of that gives any real moral permission. You don't have to cover the fact that they hate Jews. What do you mean? I'm not, I'm not covering up for it or anything like that. Um, I've, I've been pretty honest about that from the jump. Except in this circumstance, it is laughable to say, oh, they're simply doing this because they hate Jews. No, they're not doing this because they hate Jews. They're doing this because they see the Palestinians getting bombed in, an, in a very similar way to themselves. They are also, they also get help from Iran. They get to solidify their position as like the real governing body. But the reason, like, here's the funny part about it, okay? Like, you think motherfuckers who have cursed the Jews in their motto are going to hide their real reasons? Like, Americans will look at this and go, uh, look at their motto, Hassan. It says curse the Jews. Okay, so if they're that honest about their anti-Semitism, why would they fucking lie about why they're intercepting commercial vessels in the Red Sea? They would literally say, I'm doing this because I hate the Jews. It's so funny that you look at their insane motto that straight up says it. Okay. That straight up has that, which by the way, I've said 100% they're going to fucking delete that. There's no way. There is no way. That they keep that up. I I've seen it time and time again. Every fucking... Every faction, every militancy inevitably westernifies itself in an effort to, like, gain legitimacy. Obviously, after the rubble has cleared, and, and oftentimes it takes many, many years. But it is... <laughs> it is pretty funny, to me at least, that you got a group of motherfuckers who literally have this... But uh, where the fuck are you getting this? They hate the Jews info from? Like, I'm genuinely asking, other than projection of Euro anti Semitism and historical nationalist uh, movements for the end of the colonial era, like within the context, I don't see them as being anti Semitic. No, the reason why it says curse the Jews is because it's their motto. Hello? That's like, come on. It doesn't just say death to Israel and death to America, it also specifically maps out. It specifically maps out curse the Jews. Now, there are obvious reasons for that um, that are not the same as like that are not the same as like the fake made up reasons to the to assume that like Jewish people are uh, you know somehow at fault for your economy tanking like in fucking Germany or whatever. To them, they think Jews equals Israel. There, that's why I make this distinction between Hassan cute washing a Houthi rebel. Brother, I get that you want to fuck the Houthi rebel who isn't even a Houthi rebel by his own assessment, at least. And I have no reason to believe that he would hide that from me in that interview. Maybe he is, okay? But you're the one who thinks he's cute. <sighs> Like, no, I, I, I do think that, yes, having the motto, curse the Jews, is pretty fucking anti-Semitic. Come on. The reasoning behind that, however, or the, re or the way to deal with that, however, is not the same as, like, it's not the same as Western anti-Semitism. Like, some dude in Idaho getting radicalized on a fucking internet forum uh, and then and then reading like culture of critique or whatever or Mein Kampf 
is entirely different than a dude who is in one of the poorest countries on the planet. Okay. One of the poorest countries on the planet that has been getting bombed endlessly. Westerners don't understand that Jewish people are everywhere in the Middle East. I literally have Jewish family in Northern Iraq. Yeah, they don't, they don't see it. Um, <coughs> like they think that these guys went on a forum and got radicalized and got, uh, you know, and, and started LARPing as like Nazis or something. That's why it's always funny when people go, um, it's always funny when people go, oh, dude, you're, um, you know, these guys are like Nazis. It's like, no, they have their own very specific brand of anti-Semitism. Like they didn't get fucking radicalized by uh, uh, 4chan or 8chan or whatever. Yeah. The Wikipedia page for Jews in Iraq literally statement that there are fewer than two Jews in modern day Iraq, and I had to edit that out because I literally know four. Wait, but I mean, it doesn't matter. That's a minuscule number. Like, there's a very, very tiny number of Jewish people still living in Arabic countries, including the famous last Jew in Afghanistan, who ironically had to leave Afghanistan or chose to leave Afghanistan recently, which is kind of sad. Um, Like, when I talk about how um, Zionism breeds anti-Semitism, I think people just don't fully comprehend what I mean by this. They just simply think that... Here, this was a good take on it. They simply think that, like... Um, they simply think that that is, like, uh, you know, making uh, Western Jews less safe. And it certainly does. But this is the other side of the coin. Like very far away from where all of our friends live, there is a very real anger that uh, is a response to a, an American military base doing unimaginable untold violence to a Arab Muslim and Christian population, an indigenous population, that one originally was uh, created as a settler colonial movement by the British, who, of course, I don't know if you know this, but Yemen is not too fond of for understandable reasons. And then by America, continued by America. And when you, when you look at that, when you look at that and, and Israel in an effort to do defense, both uh, when when Israel, in an attempt to one galvanize uh, its own base of support from the most reactionary people in Israel, um, and also to get support from Christian Zionists and and uh, Jewish uh, Zionists alike from the Western world, um, says that they're doing everything they can uh, for Judaism and Jewish supremacy in many instances, the reaction from those are, of course, going to be... The reaction from the, the those who see themselves in the shoes of the victim is going to be, oh, yeah, no, this these guys are, are doing this for Judaism. Fuck that. In a way that is not dissimilar to the learned racism from all of the stereotyping in American news, but, of course, uh, against uh, Muslims. Okay? So this guy was uh, very upset. This ruthless cosmopolitan haver of opinions, cabal member, postmodern neo-Marxist scholar, and Bundes. Um, he posted this uh, clip from this uh, kid uh, that we had on the stream. They're, they're canceling him, I think, which is kind of funny. As like, go ahead. Uh, you can take it up with him if you'd like. Um, despite the fact that in the interview itself, he said that he uh, you know, has no issue with American anti-Zionist Jews, even though I asked him directly because I wanted to hear what his perspective was. Um, but as far as like this goes, do you threaten us with what we are waiting for? Son of a Jew. This is a translation of Abu Abeda's speech. And I think he's posting Abu Abeda's speech. 
and that's it. Um, but someone going, wow, dude, he has this anti-Semitic Instagram post. Like, yeah, okay, he's anti-Semitic. He, when he told me that he is, uh, one, not afraid of America blowing him up, and two, uh, welcomes, welcomes, uh, uh, you know, Jewish American support uh, in anti-Zionism, I mistook that. I took that for granted instead of immediately assuming that he is anti-Semitic. You can take it up with him uh, and, and try to cancel him, but here was an interesting take on it. The tragedy of oppression is that it does not produce virtuous people as liberalism likes to imagine. This is, I think, a really good uh, assessment, okay? None of these people are perfect victims. And the expectation, the expectation from, like, Westerners who support, uh, you know, people in Yemen or Westerners who lend support to Palestinians on the, on the uh, you know, on the basis that they're perfect victims are not real allies at all, okay? <clears throat> Accepting real-world oppression means taking its victims as they are, including flaws, and not constructing an ideal they must adhere to in order to be valid victims. I have to clarify, I still don't condone, condone any anti-Semitism on this guy's part, but anyone who tries to talk about anyone condoning these people has been has lost sight of the situation and really aren't trying to engage with the horrific injustice at work. And I kind of thought that this was like, um, like well-established. Like people just kind of understand that, yeah, you're you're talking about a dude who's 19 years old who's like withstood one of the more brutal genocides in modern day history. Like not all of his uh, worldviews are going to be up to the muster, up to the standards of the Western world. I mean, I know that. I don't care. And I thought I had made that very clear that I don't care about that. And people had, you know, yelled at me about it too. But the reality is, that um, none of that is what I look at when I say we have to stop bombing these people. Or none of that is what I look at when, when someone says, like, listen, this is, you know, this is a, a, a major injustice. Um, something I believe after being a Jewish member of this community for long enough is that I trust you to be able to suss out anti-Semitism and hatred on your platform, no matter the circumstances. If we had espoused, if he had espoused anti-Semitic beliefs during that interview... I would hope that he would have pushed back on that, but he didn't. So people are finding additional context to reflect poorly on the interview itself. That's exactly what's going on. And by the way, that's precisely the reason why I asked them about anti-Zionist Jews in general. The reason why I asked them about anti-Zionist Jews in general is because I wanted to, in the lightest ways possible, suss out whether or not he was going to say something anti-Semitic. Okay? And I think a lot of people, one, didn't watch it, I don't think they watched the interview, so uh, they're just operating on, like, he's a terrorist, whatever, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> How is this kid's position in any context? Any different on subtle laws? They both say the same things. Both get mistranslated, but we clearly understand this kid isn't anti-Semitic. Why not apply the same contextual framing to Ansar Allah? Because Ansar Allah's slogan still says, curse the Jews. And, like, that doesn't change my... Uh, Framework. I don't think that we should kill uh, Ansar Allah leadership. I don't think we should be bombing Yemen positions. But I'm not going to act like that is not a deeply anti-Semitic thing to say, which is why I've literally told you that in an effort to make themselves come across more uh, of a serious organization and the real governing body of Yemen, um, I suspect that they will drop the curse the Jews part of their motto very uh, quickly. Why did you mention he was media trained during the interview? It came across like his answers were very guarded and very shielded, which led me to, in my classic Westerner brain, assume that there's like, assume that it's not just that he's reserved and probably nervous, um, but instead, um, but instead like potentially, you know, uh, media trained. I didn't say he was media trained. I said he might be. I said he's coming across as media trained. 
I just like to point out that I've heard references to stuff like this before, and when I message them asking, they meant Zionist. They say, "Oh yes, of course." I did not mean brother, uh, you or anyone like you. There was another take from uh, the Malcolm X moment that Rafat had. Rest in power to Rafat. Uh, when he was 36 years old and finally traveled outside of Gaza. Um, he met Jewish people for the first time that were sympathetic to his plight, sympathetic to his existence. That was a real shocking moment for him. Nobody ever thinks about it from that uh, nobody ever thinks about it from that framework. Like they don't, they don't look at it from that uh, perspective at all. Oh yeah, it was, um, here it is. Here is Kayvon who said, I've told the story before, which comes to me from one of Max Blumenthal's books. But when Refat was touring America in 2014, he called this, his Malcolm X moment because he never met Jewish people before who empathize, empathize, emphasize with his plight. I think about that all the time. Make up, uh, make of that story what you want, but I'm not shocked that a 19 year old whose upbringing has always been backgrounded by famine and war as much engineered by America and his allies doesn't have the warmest feelings. Yeah. It's like, I don't know. Um, people trying to compare this to like a Nazi is so funny because I feel like their ideological positioning against like anyone who's Muslim is literally closer to Nazis than not. Like there are some white nationalist Nazis like those that anti-vaxxer fake doctor woman or that UFC guy that are taking advantage of this situation to like gain prominence and hiding under the banner of like defending Palestinians to launder their anti-Semitic perspectives. Right. I mean, that much is true for sure. Which one was it? Was it this? Oh, it was this one. Um, what the fuck is going on with my Chatterino is broken. God damn it. My Chatterino is broken. Why is it broken? What's happening right now? Hold on, let me try to fix this. <clears throat> okay, let's remove. Let's log in. Let's log in. Let's paste login. Oh. Oops. People expect him to be caught up on geopolitics? No, like, no, that's not the point. It, it, it's not even that. People expect him to be like, people expect him to have positions that are like uh, perfectly aligned. In, in some ways, it's no different. In some ways, it is literally no different than the, the idea that um, Israel looks at the situation and says, everyone around us is anti-Semitic. They want to kill us. That's why we have to exist in the, in the violent ways that we exist. Right? Like, oh, we cannot live with Muslims. But it's a chicken of the egg situation. And yes... The chicken in that the chicken in that circumstance, the one that comes before in that circumstance, is obvious. It is Israel portraying itself as a uh, defender of Judaism, claiming that they're doing this for Judaism. That's why I've talked about the the quickest way to understand the difference between the quickest way to understand. The difference between anti-Semitism and how it is perceived in the the uh, anti-Semitism and how it's perceived in the Western world versus and and how it starts off in the Western world versus anti-Semitism in that part of the planet. Okay, 
is proven with this dynamic right here in France or in America. When you go to a house and you tag it with a star of David, okay, that is oftentimes accompanied with an anti-Semitic hate crime, okay? Tagging people with stars of David being like they're Jews or Jew associated, right? Or suspected of being Jews, which is like one of the funniest and also scariest, but still kind of funny because it's like all 4chan dweebs that do this, uh, things that people do, right? Um, 20 month subscriber. I don't want to permanently ban you, but I think I'm going to have to permanently ban you. Someone in the, some, maybe one of the, one of the mods can, uh, you know, look through your uh, perspective here. I'm sorry. Look, I said, I'm going to be charitable and I said, I'm going to, you know what? I'm not going to ban you. I'm going to, I'm banning you. I'm going to, I'm in a good mood. I said, I'm going to be charitable. That doesn't mean I'm going to sit there and sift through someone who 100% does not care about the conflict beyond just like being able to max out on drama. Okay. Sorry. I'm having a serious conversation about my assessment of the situation. And if your job here is to be like, I'm going to promote my favorite YouTuber and you should watch his perspective on this, that is infinitely, infinitely less serious and absolutely comes from, um, their own personal motivation to cast doubt on my commentary, despite the fact that we are ostensibly aligned on the emancipation of Palestinians. Um, you're an, an, an unproductive person. I think you are operating on the boundaries of drama farming and not necessarily on, on actual discourse. It says sorry, so I'm just going to... I'm not going to ban them. I see there's like prominent black speakers have called white people the white devil before, but of course they consider us devils and they're tortured and enslaved. The difference is like... um. The difference is, even then, not all anti-Semitism in that region is the same. Because, like, you know, uh, Jews in Yemen were oppressed. For the record, that guy that I banned and then unbanned, Gizmo Max is correct, literally got clapped by Fossabot for trying to drama farm and then went out of their way to at me uh, and get around the filter by rewriting it in a silly way. Which is just like kind of lame. Don't do that, please. Like, uh, what do I always say? It's just like, we're trying to have a serious discussion. Um, you know, and, and even when I want to like, you know, throw my boots. Throw my little boots off and, and kick, my, kick my feet up on the couch and chill out. Like, that's not my... That's not going to be my favorite thing to do. <sighs> Israeli soldiers trashed our apartment in Gaza and left anti-Semitic artwork on the walls. Why anti-Semitic? Because it incites hatred against Jews. You see, when you leave the Star of David, a religious symbol on the walls of homes you invaded, trashed, or demolished, when you imprint this symbol on tanks, bulldozers, and army uniforms of genocide perpetrators, you are conflating your brand of terrorism with Judaism. And this is anti-Semitic. Israel is anti-Semitic and is harmful to Jews. It no more represents all Jews than Saudi Arabia represents all Muslims. As I see this graffiti on my bedroom wall and imagine soldiers in my home and I think of my family in Gaza, the deaths, the destruction, I am more convinced than ever of the need for all of us to call out this sham, this lie, that it is anti-Semitic to criticize Israel. I believe it is anti-Semitic not to. Yeah. As I was trying to explain, when you see a star of David on that side of the world, Specifically in like, uh, you know, Israeli occupied territories, for example, that spells trouble. That means they're coming, you know, the Israeli occupying force is going to inevitably defend the, um, inevitably defend the settlers that tagged your house that are coming to, to fuck your shit up, raise your, um, 
to to raise your your orchard. Reactionaries can arrive at anti-Zionism intellectually as well. Stop trashing us to shield yourself. What? Frustrating you to have so much nuance to the, on the Palestine story and zero nuance in conservatives' ability to be intellectually anti-Zionist. I stand with Palestine because I'm Irish, so please consider different angles. America first reactionaries can arrive at Zionism anti anti-Zionism intellectually. Reactionaries can arrive at anti-Zionism intellectually as well. What do you think reactionary is? Reactionary doesn't mean a guy who's like reacting to YouTube videos or something. What are you talking about? Free Palestine, but you are an anti-white racist? Okay, never mind. This guy might be a reactionary Irish supporter of mine who is like pro-Palestine as well. It's very odd. I don't know if you know this, but like, if you're aware that you have reactionary uh, for, uh, perspectives, you can work against that. I don't get it. Address the incoming horseshoe allegations. What is that? Like what incoming horseshoe allegation? Ridiculous. But I like you, man. Um, that's cool. Trump could give us four more years of content, and how much worse off could we be compared to Brandon style? Trump doesn't like slavery, racist prick. I think this guy's just memeing. By the way, in the 17th century, Yemenite Jews were briefly expelled for suspicions of supporting the Ottomans because the assumption was that they viewed the Ottoman rule as more tolerant. Yeah, because it was more tolerant. I mean, I think reactionaries can arrive at anti-Zionism intellectually, but reactionaries don't actually operate on intellectual uh, uh, on an intellectual basis, so... That's it. Listen. It's something to do with you using a Twitter Nazis tweets against D. Apparently that's what I read on Reddit and then clicked off shrug. Wait, what Twitter Nazi did I use against Destiny? Destiny knows a thing or two about having a prominent Nazi talk about how he wants to fucking murder me and then, uh, you know, laughing it off and posting it on LSF and then celebrating said Nazi who gave literally thousands of dollars to defend other fucking Nazis so he can miss me with this shit, okay? They said you showed a Nazi's Twitter reel? Yeah, remember when Destiny fucking literally had a prominent white nationalist loser on a stream? And uh, where he talked about how he fantasized about fucking murdering me and how his community literally loves him and defends him all the time, despite the fact that he's given $5,000 to another Nazi's defense. Suck my dick. This is what is so frustrating about oh, having this conversation with people who are deeply unserious. They do not have any fucking real frameworks that they operate off of. It's just like fuck us on and that's it. So it's so stupid when chatters come in here and finally fucking make me blow my lid, dude. Why? He literally had chicken and waffles with a fucking Nazi, a prominent neo-Nazi. When his career was dead, by the way, the neo-Nazi's career was dead. He revitalized it. Okay? The idea that, like, yeah, I can't believe he fucking revived the career of a dead, dead neo-Nazi's career because it made good content. It had chicken and waffles together. His ex-wife hung out with him. You know what I mean? Fucking sick. 
while all while also simultaneously aligning with Lauren Southern, who straight up was not allowed to go into certain countries because of her defense of Europe, I guess, alongside Identity Europa, a real white nationalist operation that Lauren Southern personally went and got on fucking, I think it was Italian ships to, to throw flares at, at incoming migrant boats. Something she was very proud of. Something that she actually filmed herself doing. You cannot come in here and tell me about like Nazi this, Nazi that when you're palling around with these people and trying to fuck them and also eating chicken and waffles with them. Get the fuck out of here. These people have made documentaries about their white supremacist values. Okay? Come on, dog. Get the fuck out of here. It's so funny when people are just like palling around with these fucking dipshits. But then again, the argument is white guys that love defending the usage of the N word turning around and saying, oh, you know what's really racist actually? The term worm, dude. That's actually what's racist. It's like, okay, well, every single member of your community calls me a fucking cockroach or a Turk roach every goddamn day in between the fucking death threats that I get from dudes you align with. How is that? How is that appropriate? Like who's fucking actually racist here? Get the fuck out of here. I don't give a shit because like, who gives a fuck? Yeah. Turk roach. It's really funny. All you've done is shown me that you're a fucking 4chan loser who's like 40 years old and desperately clinging on to the halcyon days of 4chan. Like, oh, we meme Donald Trump into the presidency. We can do it again. That's all that shows me when you use Turk Roach or Cockroach. Jesus fucking Christ. So funny that this community can still whip up enough support from dumbass fucking liberals who go, oh, that's right. Maybe Hassan is racist. Maybe Hassan is actually, uh, uh, you know, an anti-white racist. I'm white, man. I'm white. The fuck do you mean anti-white racist? Dumb fucks. Yeah, the largest post on X was a cockroach being electrocuted. The last post about me on, on Twitter is a cockroach being uh, electrocuted. But it's, again, it's funny because anyone that knows those memes is literally the biggest, most ginormous loser of all time. So it's just, that part is really awesome, I think. Go ahead, keep doing it. <laughs> yeah i heard that slur isn't even used outside of us right it's a very specific for slur yeah exactly it's not it's funny more than it is a real slur because it's only used by like the stupidest people of all time the biggest fucking losers which is precisely the reason why it does not offend me ah <sighs> The Roach racist meme was invented on 4chan by a Russian operative after Erdogan killed that Russian pilot. Oh. Anyway. Let's continue with the Yemen video. Or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> 